Hey guys, my name is Gitika Gorthy, the founder of Ignited Thinkers. On my YouTube channel, I'm starting a series called Space Champion Interviews, where I will be interviewing great space champions, learning about their careers, how they got to who they became today, and just some cool things that you guys might want to hear about and learn about yourselves. So my first interview will be with a NASA computer scientist who um, is Mr. Harrington. So enjoy the interview, and if you like it, please give a like and watch our other videos. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Gitika Gorthy, and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Mr. James L. Harrington, Jr., who is a computer scientist and space grant specialist at NASA. During our conversation today, Mr. Harrington will discuss his journey to lead to who he became today and, you know, talk about what he does at NASA and his job and role. So welcome, Mr. Harrington. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to talk to us, to talk to us today. Huh, no problem. It's my pleasure. So before we kind of get into understanding your journey and your education that led you to work at NASA today, I would like to know about your role and your job as a computer scientist at NASA. What is it like? So it's actually super, super cool. So uh, especially now as we enter uh, a new era of exploration um, to establish a permanent uh, human, human presence on the moon, and then, and then build a gateway to eventually um, establish a presence on Mars. So you, most people uh, uh, may have heard of the Artemis program by now, but that's that's pretty much the agenda, is to expand our presence. As you as you well know right now, we've been living in, in lower Earth orbit 365 days a year in, on the space station for quite some time now. So most people probably just take that for granted. They don't think about humans already living in space. And it's been that way for a while. Well, we're going to be doing that on the moon, which is got, actually going to be really super, super cool, right? And so your generation is going to be the generation that really sees that activity from, from for getting to the moon, getting to the gateway, and getting to Mars. So, um, so it's going to be very important that people like you accept that challenge and undergo uh, some fairly rigorous STEM requirements, right, to prepare yourself and your thoughts and, 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 and your skills uh, for completing that journey. Yeah, it's, it's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And so what do you do in this mission? Like, what's your role at, like, what's your daily job like? Okay. So I, I am a computer scientist. I work for two organizations. I work for an organization called the Computational Information Systems Technology Office. We serve as software and high performance computing analysts for our science and exploration directorate at Goddard Space Flight Center. So we work hand in hand with scientists to help them uh, understand uh, how to increase their science returns, implementing innovative uh, natural pro programming languages and high performance computers to tell a story that human eyes can't tell. And then we, then we work to visualize those stories. So we have a scientific visualization studio it takes those science studies and creates uh, videos for public, better public understanding. And so scientists can give talks and then, and, and then accent those talks with very powerful visualization images and movies. I also work in our Office of STEM Engagement. The Office of STEM Engagement really is where NASA conducts um, all of its or most of its educational programs. A critical component of the Office of STEM Engagement is to actively manage congressionally mandated funding to all the states in the country. That's the Space Grant Program. The Space Grant Program is designed to facilitate broader understanding of how important the space industry is to the country and to implement um, key spinoffs. There are a number of key spinoffs from space exploration, things that have been developed 
to go to, to uh, related to uh, rocketry, shuttle flights, space station inhabitants. A lot of those things end up becoming spinoffs here on Earth, right? So you'll a lot of times you'll see infomercials or commercials that they'll they'll advertise. This was just this was discovered by NASA, and now we produce this same product for your jacket that you're wearing. You know, this was a, a critical component of the spacesuits, and it kept astronauts warm. It can now keep you warm here on Earth. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think I saw one where there was a mattress that was being sold, and, and they and they advertise uh, this is what this is a spinoff from NASA. And now, when you go to sleep at night, this mattress is super cool and and helps <laughs> you sleep like an astronaut, right? Yeah, so, the amount of technology NASA has actually brought to our real world applications is huge and i don't think people realize the amount of technology and innovation that happens so congress is interested that all the states have equal access right to better understanding and participating in nasa so the space grants get funding to provide a, a number of things undergraduate student internships okay so we provide opportunities for students to come and work at NASA centers every summer. The states are given money from Congress to fund those students to come for eight to 10 weeks and conduct research. We also fund states to develop their own programs like rocketry programs. So we have a number of states and universities that fund faculty members and students to design rockets and, and blast them off just so that they can develop those skill sets to come work for us, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I work with all the states to make sure that we have every opportunity to find an interest for those states to join forces with them to, in many cases, create that next generation workforce. We have a number of uh, current employees who started out as space grant internees. Yeah. So they were they used to be interns and they kept their studies going. Yeah, and the and the and their mentors at the centers remember them. And we converted them from interns into employees. I applied to be an intern <laughs> this year, so oh, oh, oh. I got my fingers crossed. You got your fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So uh, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're gonna be hosting at the center again. I we know. weren't able to do that. All the internships were remote. But, um, you know, you never know. There's, there's a new vaccine on the horizon. So things could change pr fairly quickly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's how important the space grant program is. It really is an opportunity for every state to find ways to excite students like you and get them involved with the funding resources they need so they can do hands-on uh, educational programs and research and empower faculties to be great leaders uh, for that next generation workforce. So that's what I do. Primarily right now, I'm working in the fields of, of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we're doing some very exciting things um, within Space Grant right now to prepare students to design uh, software for autonomous roving of, of, of rovers on the moon. It's it's yeah it's it's called the uh, it's called the Artemis uh, Lunar Challenge, and so uh, we're working with a bunch of undergrads out in the um, northwest part of of the United States where there are no NASA centers, right? They they typically don't get engaged in projects like this, so we're very interested in in broadening engagement just like what you're doing, right? You're trying you're trying to connect people who traditionally aren't connected. To rocketry, right? Well, we're yeah. yep. So we're we're broadening our engagement with students out in the Pacific Northwest, where in many cases there aren't even any universities within a hundred miles of them, and you and the universities, local universities, play a major role in outreach mm -hmm. to the K through 12 and preparing students with that with teacher uh, programs, so they can have strong STEM programs in their schools. And there are a number of regions, reservations, and just rural areas that don't have major universities near them that typically get left out. 
Well, this Artemis Student Challenge is targeting those communities. And so we're working right now to teach them some, how to use some of these natural programming languages and machine learning and engage robots and help us kind of figure out how we can do some autonomous uh, discoveries on the moon where humans can't be available to do it. I know, I was actually just like, while you were talking, gonna ask you about AI and robots, because I know like artificial intelligence is becoming so popular now because, you know, things that humans can't do, robots can do, and the amount of knowledge and pictures and information we can remember and gather from those robots is just amazing because we'll see so much more information, gather so much knowledge. Do, does making these um, AI robots cost a lot more than actually sending humans to Moon and to Mars? Potentially, like it's, just curious, like how much more does it yeah, cost? It's it, it's it's not really, it's not really a, a, an activity motivated by cost. It's an activity motivated motivated by safety. Mm -hmm. Robots can can go in places where humans may not be safe. We're, we're particularly interested in, in uh, these lava tubes on the moon, where where there used to be something molten flowing. And 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 as as those as as the molten flow stopped, it left uh, a vacuum tubes there, which can be uh, very valuable areas where we don't have to build shelter. They're natural shelters, and they're 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 natural protectants from radiation, right? Direct radiation from the sun. So, to get to some of these can be quite dangerous. You know, uh, so, you, you know, ro robotic explorations usually have more to do uh, with our ability to continue to conduct exploration without potentially harming humans. That's, that's the real reason why we have astronauts on the space station so long. We, we don't still understand the, the full impacts of microgravity on the human body. Yeah. And imagine... Imagine we're going to send a, a, a man and a woman to the moon. Well, the, we, we don't even know what reproduction would be like, right? Not that these two people are expected to reproduce, but if the female astronaut ever thought she was going to want to be a mom again, if she's already a mom or a mom for the first time, if she's up there too long, what's that going to do to her reproductive system? We don't know. Yeah, I know. It's crazy to think that such fields are opening up, like particularly, I'm really interested in space medicine. I feel like people don't realize they don't have to just work at a hospital if you want to become a doctor. You could be a flight surgeon. You can literally conduct research to see what happens to human bodies in space, because I feel like that's the future. And, you know, we need that research. Absolutely. I mean, what everything that you see and everything that you hear about is, are potential capitalistic spinoffs. That's why you see all the big the big wealthy guys from Google and, and um, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk, those guys know this isn't just about uh, supporting the country and NASA. They know this is also about space tourism. So if, yeah, so if we can build a space station, right, why couldn't we sp build a space hotel? And right? The possibilities are endless. The possibilities here. are endless. So those are new engineering careers, right? Not necessarily designed. So for, for building buildings, yeah, jobs, building buildings here on Earth, but you're li literally designing a, 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 a flying infrastructure. Yeah. And yeah. So, yes, so there's, been... yeah, so the, the potential for the new jobs is just tremendous. So it's supply and demand issue, right? Mm -hmm. So if we don't have enough supply of STEM graduates who have those skill sets and that ambition like you got to join forces with people like Elon Musk, then it slows things down because we're all fighting over a small pool of students and graduates, right? We have to try to see if we, how we can attract them and split them up. Mm -hmm. In many ways, NASA can't compete with Amazon and Google. You know, they <laughs> yeah. have some incredible perks for working with those companies, yeah. not to mention very high salaries that government employees don't tend to make. Yeah. So it's really in our best interest to, to grow the pipeline of students so there's plenty to go around for everybody to, yeah. to, to make that challenge into Mars. Yeah, and that actually brings up another good point. I was having a discussion with my friends earlier about like, my friends are very non-space travel, so they think it's a lot of money and it's such, they think that it's like 
not worth it because right now on the planet we have so many issues that we could spend that money for so we always have this back and forth discussion like is it worth the money is it like to take away from something we could do here on earth and take it somewhere else that we don't know what's going to happen with it what are your thoughts on the situation well here's what i say if they if if they ever were able to figure out how the spin-offs from this research affected their everyday lives for instance uh, um, our ability to maintain uh, a harmonious climate and 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 livability on this planet um, depends heavily on our ability to advance as as a species right so the role that green energy plays the use of 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 green power sources you know solar power things like that those things are being perfected by spacecraft mm -hmm. so spacecraft really don't have an opportunity to take a lot of things with them they have to be lightweight in structure and if you notice what first thing that deploys when a space when a spacecraft um, obtains its orbit are its solar panels those solar panels are absorbing the rays from the sun and converting that into energy, mm -hmm. right? And if you know what's the, one of the biggest things that our planet suffers from in absence of research on natural clean fuel like solar know. energy mm -hmm. is burning fossil fuels, mm -hmm. right? So if you ask these same people, what are the impacts of fossil fuels on the community? with asthma, with urban heat island impact, especially those communities that are heavily populated by people who, who have the least amount of power in government yeah. and decision making, then they can understand how social impact is truly empowered by cutting edge research. And, and so if you, if, if you don't get on board with this stuff, you'll find where some people see automation, they see artificial intelligence as a way that jobs are being reduced. But when in reality, they're job creators. Yeah. We create for every job we lose, like a cashier because somebody's scanning now their own products. That's what they thought about yeah. factories. They, they were like, yeah. back then, factories, they're going to, you know, take over human jobs, but that's right. Essentially, yeah. yeah. So the programming jobs that became available for the robots mm -hmm. far outweigh the jobs for yeah. people who are using rivets, right? Mm -hmm. So what the people have to understand, it's a challenge for reskilling. The next generation humans don't necessarily have to be an expert in a single thing. They have to keep their mind and their and 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 their view flexible for constant change. The new world is going to be a world that changes constantly. Yeah. So if you're stuck in riveting a a a, a car and yeah. those and those rivets aren't required anymore, you're dead in the water, right? The new employee is not only going to understand how to write software. Right, he's going to understand, or she's going to understand how to write software for any industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if if the industry they're working with somehow experiences uh, a, a a retraction in, in job force, those workforce skills are going to be available for going to a space station. Yeah. So it's going to be very important that they not only see these as essential to evolution of man, they've got to see these as essential for them to prepare themselves mm -hmm. to compete and be a, a, a productive adult and be able to support these programs as an active voter of democracy in this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really important to understand. What are What is like something, I mean, I'm sure you've had many, have you had any obstacles, I guess, like coming to become who you are today and working as a computer scientist and like working as a, you know, in the outreach department at NASA, have you, was it a straight path like you knew you wanted to do this or did you have like twists and turns? There's always twists and turns. Yes, always. <laughs> <laughs> always twists and turns, right? Um, and I was actually 
very fortunate to get the job that I had. I was I was one of those people that benefited from having necessary skill sets that was adaptable. So I went I went to the University of Maryland and got a computer science degree. I worked in private industry, but I worked in an area of private industry that was looking to automate our uh, um, rich receivables for a very large um, uh, property management firm. And the country's economy changed where real estate started to, to decline and demand for those, for those uh, receivable rents declined. So the project that I was managing um, was no longer seen as a primary investment for the firm. And so they said, we don't think we need your services right now. If the, if, if the, if the economy had changed for us, we, you'd still be doing this, but it hasn't. And their loss was NASA's gain because the skill sets that I had as a computer science was relevant to what NASA was doing for its, 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 its goal for um, broadening participation with infrastructure. And at the same time, they really had a major push for broadening the participation of minorities into the workforce. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I was a prime candidate. So make sure you tell your friends, you know, I went from a place where I, the, I was, it was communicated that I was no longer needed, but with the computer science degree, I had no issues with getting a new job. And, and, and it was a blessing because be honest with you, NASA was far more cool. Than yeah. what I was doing. <laughs> Way more cool. Way yeah. more cool. Yes. <laughs> and I feel like something is also important to understand for students who are getting, don't know much about space. They're scared. They think they have to be like super geniuses in physics or something, but they don't realize that NASA has so many, such a broad range of career options, whether it be from an artist trying to design like compact, like ways to, you know, take so many supplies and put into such a small place or from like engineers to doctors to, you know, like communicators, marketing, outreach, like everything. Like there's just so much to NASA that people just like focus on this one, like Albert Einstein type genius and they get like the stereotype, which is so wrong. And so do you have any advice for students, I guess, who are not sure whether they're, they want to go into space or they're kind of like coming back? What's your advice to students? My advice again is to be adaptable, right? Mm -hmm. So I got a great quick story for you. Yeah. I was up at a I was up at a space grant meeting in Rhode Island with all the northeastern states, and there was a Rhode Island School of Design. I got there was a faculty member presenting, he brought like four students with him, right? Mm -hmm. And in that design school that does not not they 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 don't push STEM as a major priority. These are people who have an eye for design, right? And so they're, they're more liberal arts types of students. Mm -hmm. And he got them interested in designing habitats for NASA. And he developed a relationship uh, with Johnson Space Center where the astronauts train. Mm -hmm. And so they started looking at space in the space station and how would a design, interior designer, not, a, not an engineer, how would an interior designer, right? We we all see the shows on HGTV, right? Yeah, Where people, yeah. people are designing rooms and houses, right? Well, well, how would an interior designer attack a space station's design interiorly so so that humans could be com comfortable, right? And they all started doing it. And then the next step was internships. You know, the, the NASA Johnson was like, you know, we're interested in having some of those students come down here and look at some of the things that we're designing you see, how, what's, how would a designer, an uh, interior designer, uh, approach that? So they started sending interns. So they let one of the students talk, and she, she got up in front of everybody. She said, first of all, um, I told my dad I wanted to work for NASA. He said, you're out of your mind. You don't know anything about science. You don't know anything about math. There's no way you're going to ever work for NASA. She goes, well, Dad, we've got this really cool project at our school, and and, 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 NASA's gonna, and NASA wants me to come down and do an internship. You're still not going to be hired. You've got to understand. You've got to understand science. You've got to understand math. She goes, yeah. okay, Dad, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to find out how it works. She did three internships. She now works at Johnson Space Center, right? She says her dad was like, you got me. I never thought somebody from a school of design could come to work for NASA. Mm -hmm. 
So that's a very good example of how you can explain to people. We take people from all different types of backgrounds because the ability to, to discover and inhabit different, different environments means medical issues, right? Physical issues. I mean, you can, you can probably imagine a personal trainer maybe being, a comp, you know, accompanying on a mission because he's trying to show all the astronauts how to stay in shape and how to stay healthy. There's yes, all kinds of jobs. Space and like to get yeah. used to like that. Yeah, the physical fitness part. I haven't even thought about that nutrition That's aspect. Right. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's yeah. Pretty, it's so, so big. It's so big, right? Everyone should be able to see themselves in some yeah. kind of way uh, yeah. in, in, in space. Yeah. And it's just so cool to see how space is truly for everyone. I feel like through my nonprofit, I always try to push the fact that you don't have to be like a super genius or you don't have to be like a mathematician or a scientist. And your example perfectly portrays that if you have a passion or you just like a certain interest, I feel like it can mold anywhere within NASA if you want to potentially work for NASA and the government. I feel like, you know, something to take away is space is truly for everyone. And I don't want to take more of your time. Okay. Um, and I want to ask you one last question which I think people are excited for is what do you foresee in your industry or something that excites you about your industry that you're in right now which I think you kind of covered already but yeah well I, I foresee humans and computers increasing science and technology hand in hand mm -hmm. you know our, our next generation of, 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 of processors now, coupled with the ability to use cloud computing and, and exponentially grow um, uh, computing nodes makes these platforms ever more powerful. And, but they have to be trained. They're, 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 they're just, they just sit until we have the ability to write code and tell them what to do. We need to be able to verify their, their outcomes though, right? Because if they come back and say two plus two equals five, that's bad for us, right? Yeah. So we have to be able to verify their outcomes, but they can probably multiply a gazillion times a gazillion way faster than you and I can if it's yeah. an accurate outcome, right? Mm -hmm. So I see opportunities for students like you who can develop a mastery of programming languages in a way that, that was never available for me. It was very cryptic when I came up through computer science, the way you have to code. Now we're using natural language processors where you can almost write code the way you talk. Yeah. So if you can write code the way you talk, in other words, you know how That's you sit in your, in your house so now easy. and you say, yeah, you say, Google, uh, turn on some rock and roll. Yeah. It uses your natural language that you're speaking and turns it into actual instructions that yeah. it can understand. Yeah, that would be, so oh, wow. that's powerful for everybody. All you now need is an idea and a strategy. And you can use natural language processing to do almost anything your innovative minds can think of. Wow, that's mind blown. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, thank you so much for this discussion. I truly enjoy talking with you and I just, it made me think even in a broader direction. So I'm sure everyone who watches will think, wow, you know, like space is truly such a big area. And I feel like you can't just pinpoint and be like, this is, this is it, this is it. It's just so big. And I want to thank you so much for your time and, you know, um, giving us so much insight into what you're doing. And it's truly inspirational to see, you know, trying to inspire the future generations towards doing something better for all of us and potentially like making a better place for all of us. So thank you. Thank you for reaching out to me.